Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, listeners, to episode 133 of the Ad Nauseam Podcast. My name is Dr. Jeff Winkle. I'm down here in the bunker on a cold, not really cold, but kind it's, of... It's drizzly. It's a drizzly, dreary night here. It feels like October. It does. Uh, here in West Michigan. I'm down here in the bunker with my good friend and co-host, uh, partner in crime, Dr. David Noe. How are you feeling? Do you think that... I'll well, answer that question. Okay, please. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think the month is making fun of us? October has that kind of attitude yeah. about it, yes. It's more like Mocktober. It is kind of like Mocktober. It is. Right. I'm feeling pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, I was down in a southern climb, as you might know, down in the great state of Texas, as hey, were you. So was I. Coincidentally. But we were not down there together. No, you were down there for play. I was, I was down there for work. It's true. Yep. Did yep. I say that with sufficient contempt? I heard it. Okay. I heard it. It was, yeah, Tell it, us what you were doing down there. I was down there. I was in uh, the great city of Dallas. Uh-huh. And I met a couple of old college friends of mine. It's a suburb of Fort Worth, right? Uh, exactly. <laughs> right. And um, one uh, one of my friends come driving up from Waco, uh, or his wife his wife teaches at Baylor, and another friend from Chicago. And we all met up and we hung out in the city for a couple of days, saw a concert. I got to uh, indulge in my... Uh, my JFK uh, assassination oh. buff stuff. Back and to the right. Yes, exactly. Right. Back yeah. and to the right. right. So I had to dra- drag my two buddies along. They didn't seem all that interested, yeah. but I mean, uh, that was great. Uh, hmm. I had been at Dealey Plaza uh, years before and right. for a conference, but it was great to just kind of hang out and linger and and uh, see a lot of the stuff I've been reading about. It's, it was it was tremendous fun. I was there as a kid in Dealey, Dealey Plaza. Mm-hmm. This would have been, oh, I don't know, late 80s. Yeah. Uh, mid to late 80s. And uh, my mom's cousin toured us around the sites. Oh, no way. He was a Dallas native, knew a lot about it. But, sure. You know, I had read the basic, uh, you know, the basic tale of what happened to our former president. Right. But interesting. Right, right. So it's one of those places I was saying this to my, to my friends that, you know, often when you see something on television or in photographs, you know, for all your life and then you visit and you say, wow, it's so much bigger or it's so much smaller. Right. This is one of these places so where- So much smellier. So much smellier. This is one of these places I showed up and it, it looked and felt exactly the way I expected it. Huh. To, right. And it, it's also, it really struck me about how, you know, a lot of that surrounding area in the buildings has is has remained unchanged since yeah. 1963. So it, it, a lot of people walking around with flat tops and crew cuts and that, that brief, was, briefcases. That, that was the oddest thing of all. Exactly right. <laughs> Right. Skinny black ties and white yeah. shirts. Right. Strange. So, but yeah, I mean, it looks, I think they purposely kind of kept that, that block or so as kind of mm. a time capsule. It was, right. It was fascinating. It is interesting. Yeah. And you were down um, at, at Baylor. I was right? at Baylor University. Doing yep. a, a, a Bidouum. The Bidouum Baylorense, the first one, the, the Bidouum Primum Baylorense. All right. With my good friend and a fabulous, he's not a co-host, yes. but a fabulous Latin teacher, Dr. Patrick M. Owens and uh, Dr. David White who's a part of the uh, Baylor University Classics Department. They invited yeah. me down there to speak some spoken Latin, so I spoke. You spoke? I did. Was it kind of a hit and run? You came in, spoke, and you got out of there? Well, I did. I okay. mean, I came in a little bit early to visit my daughter, who's a student there, mm-hmm. um, but I could only participate on Saturday. had to get back for other work. Gotcha. And lo and behold, yeah? you would not believe this. What? All of my flights on the way back, yeah. flawless. So were mine. This has never happened. <laughs> Have you kept- I thought I was in the twilight. <laughs> I kept waiting for something to break for a gate to be canceled, you know. You do have a kind of history of getting stranded. Mothra to fly across <laughs> the tarmac, you know. Sorry, folks, we can't uh, take off. We're experiencing Dude, Mothra. Mothra. That's a Simpsons bit. But I thought there's no way I'm getting out of here. Yeah. But everything was perfect. Right. So it kind of made you probably a little bit suspicious. Yeah, right. what's going on? Waiting for the hammer to drop. It's a locus of moinus. Uh, right. What what was the, the locus? Of, the Dallas Fort Worth Airport? No. Okay. But the whole experience, right? The perfect setting where oh, some I see. some hidden danger lurks. Mm. But all my connections. I even had to go to Atlanta. You know, and you don't want to go to Atlanta. What? Why were you going to? Atlanta? That was my connection oh, okay. on the way back. Gotcha. Dallas to Atlanta to Grand Rapids, flawless. Wow. Right. And you weren't rushing from one gate to another. It no, was I strolled. Of, you were, were, really? I perambulated. <laughs> wow. 
Wow. Man. It was really quite, uh, it was quite relaxing. Well, so. I, I hope you soak that in because I don't think it's that's never going to happen. It's never going to happen again. <laughs> right. So what are we doing tonight, Dr. Winkle, well, other, other than this uh, patter, which really entertains us and only us? Right. Um, apparently, we're talking about a history of education in antiquity. Why do you say apparently? Well, because you just, you handed me the sheaf of notes and I'm, and, and I'm always surprised about what we're talking about. We talked about this last <laughs> I know, week. I know. I know we did. But, yeah. Um, this sounds like, uh, Dave, this sounds like a huge subject. It is huge. Okay. Uh, the volume that I hold in my hands what? is a veritable tome. I think it clocks in at, uh, if we count the notes and if we count the index, which, you know, it's really not something you normally do, 466 pages. So what is this tome? Who wrote it and why? It was written by, uh, here's my attempt at some French. It was written by Henri Irene Mahou. Okay. Yep. All right. And eventually we'll get to who he is. Why we care and why we uh, are indulging in this topic. Fantastic. Why it might be of interest to our listeners. Yes. All but right. first, we have a very nice shout out this week. We do. This came in uh, through the interwebs uh, mm-hmm. to both of us. And uh, you, well, let me start this off. Here. Okay. So this, this comes from one. Uh, how, how about I read the PSs, etc. And you read the first chunk. Okay. Because that just about makes it equal. Sounds good. So this comes from one uh, Hope Lad who writes to us, Hi, Dave and Jeff. Just wanted to send along a quick note of thanks for your excellent podcast. She had me in the first sentence. She did. <laughs> we should stop there. I love your podcast and have listened to almost all your episodes some multiple times. Now, okay. I'm, 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 liking, I'm liking Hope a lot already. <laughs> already. Uh, some highlights for me include the episode on the Delphic Oracle. Hold it right there. Yeah. That was, uh, we're off to see the wizard, remember? Is, was that the one? That was the one where we had the little bit of um, Wizard of Oz oh, music right. as the lead in. Yeah, exactly. I thought that was a bit of a dud, honestly. Was it? Well, I mean, in terms of downloads, but yeah. uh, Hope liked it. I, so. hope, hope liked it. So. Yeah. All right. Uh, she also likes, she says, you're a Neat series. I guess she had three years to burn. <laughs> and 10 Things You Hated About Grad School. I was a fan of that one. Too. I like that one, yeah. yeah. I appreciate the way you integrate serious scholarship and analysis of text with an accessible and casual format. Please keep it up. I've also been a long time enjoyer of Professor Noe's Latin per diem videos. They helped me through high school Latin and a classics major at Hillsdale College in Michigan. Um, I wonder if she, uh, she knows uh, uh, Dr. Patrick Owen. She might. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And now provide me a great source of enrichment as I pursue a PhD in classics at the University of Virginia. Fantastic. That's really nice. Yeah. She's on one of the most beautiful campuses I was just gonna in say, the country. I was going to say, that is an incredible Charlottesville setting. there in the spring. Maybe, I've never been there in the autumn, but in the spring, it's just gorgeous. It is perfect, yeah. She finishes up, uh, thanks for all that you do. And um, about some PSs. Yes, I'll read the string of PSs. Yeah. Um, she says, P.S. I have also recently availed myself of your Hackett code for some Bryn Mawr Greek and Latin commentaries and yes. plan to do so again in the future. Great stuff. This is a wise young woman because those uh, Bryn Mawr commentaries on the Greek and Latin texts, I've used many of them. Mm-hmm. Herodotus is one of the first books I used uh, in grad school. The Bryn Mawr commentary. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes. I assume you've used those before? Oh, yeah. I got a bunch on my shelf. Okay. Yes. Now the P.P.S., the post postscript. I don't know if you are open to requests. Well, the answer is no, Hope. I'm sorry. (laughs) Wait a second. Okay. (laughs) Especially because of what comes next. She says, but if you are, I'd really like to hear Dr. Winkle finally get to talk about Apuleius. Yes. No. Hope. Yes. Well, Hope, be careful what you wish She just got canceled. Okay. (laughs) Now the PPPS, the post, post, post script. Mm -hmm. Since you insisted, a complaint. I'm mad that I didn't win win the Ratio 6 giveaway mm. you ran a couple years ago, and I'd like a second shot. Oh, okay. Smiley face. Yeah. Well, we might have, we'll have to uh, run that past the great uh, Mr. Helwig. That's right. And see what we can do about that. Yeah, but I'm so glad that you know it was a popular giveaway, yeah. and it reminds me that, um, yeah, we should do that again. It'd be fantastic. Yeah, give her another shot at it. That's great. And she concludes with best hope lad. Hope Lad, thank you so much, Hope. Uh, yeah, we are really thrilled that you would take the time to listen to us and send us this uh, kind and encouraging note. We hope that your studies there at Virginia are going swimmingly. Yeah. Uh, that is a great institution, and uh, we're very pleased that you're carrying on the torch. Yeah, I would, and I would love to hear uh, like what corner of the classics you're going to yes. zero in on. Okay. Yes, probably Apuleius. I'm guessing. After you do a couple episodes uh, on that. I'm guessing. That's We'd like to hear from you, sure. Hope, in a couple years, you know, and you can tell us now you're a... Uh, tenured professor with an endowed chair at some hoity-toity university. Fantastic. That'd Fantastic. be good news. All right, Dave, let's dive into this. All right, All right so here what we are, go. What are we talking about? What's, what, give, me, give us some details here. Okay, so uh, this gentleman, Henri Irene, Henri Irene Mahu, 
right? Mm -hmm. This is from the Wikipedia article. Born 12 November 1904 in Marseille. And he died uh, April 11, 1977. He was a French historian, a Christian humanist in his outlook. I like that. His work was primarily in the spheres of late antiquity and the history of education. He is best known for his work, History of Education in Antiquity, which is what we're dealing with. He also edited for uh, Source Chrétien, the early Christian work, Letter to Diognetus, which is an important letter, by the way. The only manuscript of which perished in a fire at the University of Strasbourg during the Franco-Prussian War. Mm. Maru edited the collection Patristica Sorboniensa, published by Les Sieux. His work has been criticized by the philosopher, no, I can't really even pronounce this one, Il Citro Hado. Yeah. Okay. You think that's all right? That looks all right, yeah. Macru also wrote under the pseudonym of Henri Davidson. Do you have any pseudonyms, Jeff? I don't. I, I always wish I had a pseudonym. Didn't you have to write under a pseudonym for the songwriting competition you entered? Uh, no, I don't believe so. I don't, no? I, I, don't, I don't think I entered a songwriting competition. I have a few pseudonyms. Well, please share. John Rollerball. <laughs> It's a pen name, right? All <laughs> oh, right, exactly. Uh, what's one of some of the others? Penford Plumewright. Oh, nice. Right, right. Uh, John Bick. John Bick. <laughs> right. Hey, those are pen names. <laughs> right, right. Anyway, his uh, Chane Possumes were published in 2006 under the editorial supervision of his daughter, Francois Marie Flamand. He had all of these distinguished titles heaped upon him, including elected a foreign member of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. And then follows the long list of publications, all in French. You want to read a couple of those? These are. This is intimidating. Yes. So yes. Yeah. I think the only one I can pronounce is maybe the first. My <laughs> the, French is not so good. The uh, Fondement uh, d'une culture chrétienne. That's correct. Right? Oh, here's one I've consulted a few times: Saint Augustine et la fin de la culture antique, Saint Augustine and the end of antique culture or uh, late antiquity. Mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so forth. Yes, my goodness, he's he's cranking out. A, it looks like a almost like a book a year. Prolific for a huge stretch. Very prolific. Yeah. Yes, forty two, forty four, forty eight, fifty, fifty four, etc. Mm -hmm. Now you know I have mentioned before I am a great fan of Werner Jaeger. Yes, I read his three volume Paideia, right? The Ideals of Greek Civilization. I've read his Paideia and Christian Culture. Mm -hmm. But as I was reading this, I had um, some sudden feelings of concern. Because he criticizes Jaeger at a couple of points for being kind of an unreconstructed late 19th century German. Oh, really? Yes. And I thought, I mean, that's not when Jaeger lived and worked, but he came out of that, to use the French word, milieu. Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, soup. Um, he came out of that, and I thought, maybe my admiration for Jaeger should be tempered a little bit by the insights of this somewhat bellicose Frenchman. Yes. Well, interesting. Yeah. So, so has it changed your? your well, I haven't your... finished reading the book. Okay, <laughs> it's four hundred and sixty-six pages. Right. Okay, right. But the the part we'll talk about, you know, before too long, is his discussion of Spartan culture, mm. the Spartan mirage, and uh, here is a place where, and other places where he criticizes Jaeger a little bit okay. for buying into the the German Kool Aid, you might say, Drink, okay. drinking the German Kool Aid. All right. Okay. That's anachronistic, of course. Right. That sounds very interesting. Yep. Yeah. I love it when the scholars kind of throw down and get a yes. little bit snarky, right? Yep. So that's who Mahru was. But now, Jeff, yes. why should we care about this question of history of education in antiquity? Well, I have. I really have no idea. I, I mean, I'm not sold on Did you yet. care? No, <laughs> <laughs> well, here you go. We ourselves, right, are mm -hmm. educated. Yes. Now, when someone says, I'm educated, they usually mean that they are well-educated, which is a separate claim. Um, but we ourselves, like almost everybody, has an education. And in fact, we continue to be educated cradle to grave. Mm -hmm. Do you have the sense that your education continues? Absolutely. Yes. Can you give us some examples? Well, I think that, I mean, as one of the things I always say to to my classes is that I think one of the things that I want you to take away from this class is that you leave more curious than you were when you came in. Mm -hmm. And so that, this idea that this isn't, um, ideally this isn't just kind of a time we spend together and we cram in this stuff and we spit it back out, but hopefully this will instill kind of a a, a love of knowledge, a curiosity, a, right. a, 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 a deep desire to want to know more. Mm -hmm. So it's the kind of stuff that kind of you know, keeps me getting out of bed day after day. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is something that has emerged for me a little bit more in recent years, right? Mm -hmm. When you're just coming up and you're trying to learn so much information, 
it's a little bit overwhelming. I've been at this a while, as have you. Mm -hmm. And so I have developed maybe a minor expertise in a couple of areas, right? Yeah. So when people begin to recognize this a little bit, right, um, it's very important so you take away their nervousness not to present yourself as the expert, mm. but instead simply to say, well, you know, we're both students here. I may be just a little more experienced, right. mostly because I'm older <laughs> right, right, right. than a lot of my students. Right, that's very Socratean. Well, you don't want to fall into, you know, the, the trap of thinking of yourself as an expert because then you will immediately be embarrassed by something you don't know. Right, of course. No, no, that's very, very true. Yeah. I would Going back to kind of something you, you, you said just a couple minutes ago is that, yeah, I think that, I think when people, a lot of people describe themselves as being educated. Right. I'm not sure if you were to press people, exactly what do you mean by that? They, I think a lot of people just default say, well, I have a degree in something, oh, right? you think that's what it reduces to well, I, I in some people's thought? My sense is, is is yes. I think that the idea of, okay, what does that fundamentally, fundamentally mean to be to be well-educated? Right. I think for a lot of people, I, um, it's just, well, I, went, I jumped through these particular hoops. And I have this piece of paper that says I'm educated, but yeah. what it really means, I think, I think a lot of people would be at a loss to really describe that. Right. Well, I yeah. think I think that's right, and that's a good reason why we might look at this book. Yeah. And look at what did education mean in antiquity? Yeah. And does it have any bearing and relevance for today? For example, I was talking to a friend on the phone this past week. Uh, he knows someone who teaches at Princeton, mm -hmm. and he was telling me that. Um, Wall Street recruiters flock down there to try to recruit Princeton students, mm -hmm. you know, because they are by reputation the brightest and the best. Yeah. So um, I don't know if getting out of Princeton leads to lots of career success. It's more, can you get into Princeton, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a, a common pattern, I think, at a lot of institutions. They more often trumpet the, the quality of their entrance than of, you know, what happens on the other end when they exit? Right, right. No, no, exactly. It's, I mean, always, I, I often when talk when when people ask me about my time at Northwestern as, right. as a graduate student, and um, Northwestern, another school that again has a has a, a very good reputation. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I mean, I think if if parents knew how many of the classes their kids were in were being taught by twenty three year old. Um, of whom you were one, of one twenty-three-year-old, uh, you know, experienced list teachers like yeah. myself, it would be shocking. Yeah, uh, and so it's the it's the stamp, it's the seal, it's it's the it's the brand, correct? More than it is the actual experience. Now Northwestern right? is not Ivy League, right? It is not. Is it like Cabbage League or like um, Lettuce League? Or? Yeah, it's more Cabbage, okay. I'd say. Right. Right. Um, but I mean, uh, I don't want to dip back into no, no. You know, the ten things I hated about grad school, right. and as much as that would please hope. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, the, the you know the teaching loads of, of the you know the great luminaries in my department teaching one class. Yeah. Uh, semester yeah um, so what does that all mean right right yeah. second point not only were we ourselves educated and continue to be so we ourselves ourselves are educators yes so can you give us jeff a brief synopsis a couple couple sentence statement of your own pedagogy just to try to set up this episode why is it interesting why would we care about the history of education in antiquity so you want me to just say something like, like my, as briefly as possible what's your to, what's your pedagogy my pedagogy is largely structured structured or i mean it's hard to, to talk about this without kind of sounding um but i invited you to I've, uh, i forced you to to i don't want to sound cliched uh, in that i i try to stress um uh the discipline of critical thinking mm -hmm. and so i try to um structure a lot of my time in the classroom around kind of defend and refute ideas so you kind of, uh, I'll take a, uh, an issue and I'll present two kind of polarized sides of the argument and, and then ask the class to, to uh, muster evidence to decide which side they think is the better one. Okay. That and, sounds very plausible. Right. And then from there, you know, it can be, it, it can, it can take a, a number of different tangents. But mm -hmm. how about, what, what would you say to that? Well, I would, um, you know, in, in recent years, there has been a contrast between the sage on the stage. Yes. The person who stands up front and delivers information that he or she has carefully curated and cultivated over many, many years. Mm -hmm. uh, that has lost favor as opposed to the guide on the side. Yes. Who stands alongside the student and is a co-learner. Right. I'd like to opt for a third model. Okay. The jerk out of work. <laughs> I thought you were going to say the fool in the pool. There you right? go. No, but I, I'm a strong advocate of um, sage on the stage. Yeah. Not that one has to control the environment all the time, but part of being a, um, a good teacher, I think, is to exemplify the traits you want to cultivate in your student. Mm -hmm. And if you are never showing them the traits you want them to exemplify, mm -hmm. which are more than empathy, 
empathy is a good trait. Yeah. But expertise of knowledge is also a good trait. Yes. And you have to exemplify that sometimes, not in a proudful way. Right. But you have to show this is what it means to know how to do this. Exactly. You can do it too. Right. right. Exactly. So yeah, it's I, I've always been uncomfortable with that that kind of guide on the side that you know, well, you know, the the the, the students. I'm really there to learn from the students. Yeah. Right. And no. 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 I mean, because that ha- that happen that might happen. I'm not in, paying them. Right. Right. <laughs> that might happen kind of inadvertently. It does happen to sure. me quite often. A student teaches me something. Right. But it, to to me, it always it just sounds more like uh, the inmates running the asylum. I think so. But but yeah, no, I'm with you. I'm uh, some kind of hybrid between those two that I think that leans more towards the sage on the stage. Right. I think so for whatever reason in our culture right now we have kind of a um, we, we 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 like to dismiss expertise or right. or to claim expertise is, is to be I don't know hubristic. Yes. I, I, it's weird. Unless the individual you know says exactly what we need for a particular pragmatic end, then we're yeah. very happy to have their right, right. their imprimatur. Yeah. Third reason um, maybe to to look at Mahru and this book there has been a great resurgence lately in so-called mm-hmm. classical education, scare quotes. Yes. And we may be able to shed some light on this topic based on Makhru. We may be able to open a window on the topic or maybe even lower the drapes. I don't know what the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Take out the trash. You know how the Romans disposed of their garbage typically? Yeah, they just dump just it out the window. Throw it out the window. Right, right. <laughs> which is why uh, you wanted to live in the penthouse. Yeah, because nothing's that's that's the very day nothing's coming down on you. That's correct. Right, <laughs> you did not want unless you had your own, you know, villa. But yeah, right. I mean, are there other reasons why we might be interested other than you know historical curiosity in uh, education in antiquity? I'm I'm definitely uh, I'm I love the uh, just the 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 historical curiosity part of it, but I'm also really interested in pursuing um, how much of this stuff do we still see. Yeah. How much of this stuff is still kind of part of our of our system that we kind of unthinkingly kind of accept that this is the way it is? And Brilliant. We, and in what, pla- in what ways have we kind of discarded a lot of this stuff? That's an excellent question. You have anticipated. You didn't read this book? I, I did not. No. You've anticipated some of the very things that Mauru says. Okay. Um, so, do we have an opening quote? Well... Well, do it's it, all an opening quote. The whole book is an opening <laughs> quote? Okay. No, I mean, as we go through it this evening, it's going to be kind of this, in the style that we went through uh, Carl Richard's book, uh, The Founders and the Classics, oh, yeah, yeah. which was kind of like an extended leisurely book review, uh, but I think it worked well. Okay. So this is a tome, right, divided into three parts, um, and part one in seven chapters, Homer through Isocrates. Okay. Homer through Isocrates, uh, which was a, a book by Philip Dick, I think. The, didn't he? I, Socrates. Oh, I. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I prefer the movie. Or was that Asimov? Did he Asimov write? Asimov wrote, wrote I, Robot. Oh, that's what I'm thinking Phil, of. Phil, um, Man he, in the High Tower. He wrote, um, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So this is Isocrates, who was a, a near contemporary, a little bit younger, um, actually a little bit older than Plato. So that's part one, seven chapters. We're going to get through a good portion of part one this evening, okay. but this is a long book. We might have to do multiple episodes on this, uh, but maybe not consecutively. Okay. Part two, uh, 11 chapters, and this is the civilization of Paideia through the concept of classical humanism. And this is where probably most people are going to find the meat of the book. Okay. Um, this deals with, you know, Athens at its zenith during the Pentecontitia and so forth. Mm-hmm. So this week we lay the groundwork, but next week we look at a, a lot of different things like uh, physical education, artistic education, primary school, primary education, science, and higher education. And it ends with rhetoric as the queen of the sciences. So is that the section that will probably um, be the most germane to kind of talk about what do we mean by, by classical education today? Absolutely. Okay. All right. And so what I hope to do at that point, I mean, we'll see what happens, is compare a little bit. Um, some of the things that I hear are happening in classical education around the country mm-hmm. uh, with how the ancients perceived it. And I think we'll find some startling similarities and some startling uh, differences, Excellent. discrepancies. That sounds really interesting. Okay. Chapter th- uh, part three, 10 chapters plus an epilogue, beginning with the old Roman education and ending with the end of the School of Antiquity. So that's where it all wraps up. Fantastic. Sounds great. All right, Dave. So what do, what does Henri himself say is, is the reason to be, that we should be interested in this stuff? Yeah. So this is from the introduction, uh, Roman numeral number 11. He says, the following effort at a treatment of the whole, 
the subject of the history of education in antiquity, mm -hmm. uh, revealed, he says, all the gaps too clearly. He says, prior to the writing of this work, this subject had been treated in a kind of hit or miss fashion. Okay. Right? So uh, specifics on this, you know, going deep on Sparta, going deep on Athens, maybe a deep look at late antique uh, education, but no one had synthesized the whole. Okay. He says, so he wanted to put them all together. So, right? so is there an implicit uh, uh, critique of Jaeger in, in that? Not yet. Okay. No, you got to wait for that. That's coming later, he okay. says. <clears throat> He says, our ideas about man and his life and the world he lives in are in a continual process of transformation. Every historical subject needs periodic revision to be put in its proper place in the new perspective that has had to be adopted because the whole pattern of history has meanwhile been modified. Hmm. What do you think? Can you read that last part uh, again? Yes. Uh, um, every historical subject needs periodic revision okay. to be put in its proper place in the new perspective that has had to be adopted because the whole pattern of history has meanwhile been modified. I it's just, he's just saying things change. Okay. People's general view of history changes. Right. Any given subject, therefore, has to be re-examined and then re-presented to a general audience. So is, I mean, is he claiming in a statement like that, uh, what I've often heard that... Um, a true understanding of the past as the past is impossible. And we can only interpret it through the lenses that we currently have at our disposal. I would say that he's not saying a true account of the past, but a an enduringly true account of the past. Okay. So you have a true account of the past, perhaps momentarily. Mm -hmm. He's not a subjectivist, I don't believe, okay. based on what I've read. I guess that's what I was asking. Yeah. But that can't last. Yeah. That view won't last. Um, I believe that uh, much of this was written prior to the decipherment of Linear B. Oh, okay. So if you yeah. go back to Margaret Fox, right. right, that really good episode, um, which needs some needs some downloads, folks. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is this is uh, before right. that. that bomb so that gets yeah. updated, right? Okay. The um, the the papyri from Herculaneum, All right. right, are being read. Okay. Yeah, I guess that's different um, than what I was thinking in terms of updating. I mean, you're talking about response to like new material finds that are coming out, right? Well, not only that, but, but the new ways that people are perceiving these things. Okay, all right, yeah. All right. So the rise of certain um, interpretive grids, right? Yeah. Marxism, feminism, yeah. whatever has come on. This stuff has to be read again. Maybe the interpretations of them don't have to be changed. I don't know, but they have to be reread and represented. Okay. Fair enough, fair enough. Sounds good. He also says, right, the history of education in antiquity is not without relevance to our modern culture. Mm -hmm. For in it, we can trace the direct ancestry of our own educational tradition. We are the heirs of the Greco-Latins, and everything of importance in our own civilization derives from theirs. Hmm. Uh, there's a programmatic statement. Yes. Okay, yes. I think that's a, that's a, a statement that many people today would have a, a problem with. Oh, yeah. Yes. Most of all, he says, is this true of our system of education? Okay. Which is an even stronger statement. So it's not just, say, the terminology that we use, uh, the way we view ourselves as individuals, our democratic systems and mm -hmm. so forth. It's primarily a system of education. Okay. All right. That's the most influential area. All right. So that's fairly high praise. I mean, yeah. take, of all the things that were bequeathed to, to later culture by the, by the Greeks and by the Romans, he's saying education is at the top of that list. Right. Not only an influence, but an importance. Importance, right. right. Does, I mean, does he ever kind of come down from that or temper that a bit? I think so. Um, on the next page, right, page 12 of the introduction, he says, the sympathy which a historian must feel for his subject obliges me to appear as advocate for the ancient system of education. Mm -hmm. For we must understand before we pass judgment. I really like that expression because this is something that, without having read Malkru, I have been telling people for a long time in my own classes, and it's what I've tried to um, exemplify, which is you have to really deeply understand something. You have to even pretend to like it if, if necessary before you can um, criticize it. Yeah. So don't don't dismiss it out of hand. Right. Try to like it. I would say even something that's morally problematic. Yeah. Really work hard to think. Why would someone do this? Are there are there any exculpatory reasons I haven't considered? Right. Because then when you come to oppose it, you know you're doing so 
as much as possible from an honest standpoint. Yeah, it reminds me of that I love that great quote from G.K. Chesterton. It says, "If you encounter, if you find a fence in the middle of the woods, right, don't tear it down before first finding out why it's there in the first place." Oh, that's clever. Isn't that great? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm okay. I'm on board. Yep. yep. But then he says, "But the reader must remember that I present him with it." meaning this system of education, simply as an example to reflect upon, not as a model to be slavishly imitated. Hmm. Okay. So it's not advocacy, even though it has to appear that way, because he's trying to to give the best possible presentation of the material. Okay. Now let me ask a question. I, I'm not sure if you can, if you can answer it, but um, a lot of the stuff that he's saying uh, it seems to be in what, when this book came out, 1948, mm, 50, 56, 56, 56, um, would have been, uh, very non-controversial. So it, why, that's right. So why is he coming out to, to get to make this defense in a time where my, my sense in European education, mm. this would have been, uh, a kind of like a no duh. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think that, um, Classicism had eroded quite a bit by the 1950s. Okay. Um, classicism as constituting the best and highest education. Um, reading Carl Richard's book, what is it? Um, um, classical studies in the in the antebellum. No, it's called the the golden age of of classical studies in America. Mm-hmm. Right. I think he traces that trajectory. It peaked. 1860, 1870. Oh, okay, so that far back. Yes. Okay. Maybe 1880. Um, so this is almost uh, it's almost a full hundred years after that. Correct. Okay. All right. So some of the things that we as classicists might bemoan now, they're you know they're way down the road from the actual um, starting point yeah. of this. Yeah. The rise of you know technical schools, uh, people back then like Ventris who um, became an architect, mm-hmm. he still studied Greek and Latin. Yes. Now, if you want to be a, a doctor, an architect, any kind of profession, a beginning in classics is not considered necessary. Exactly. Exactly. So, so that's I think a something that began long before um, 1956. Gotcha. That's interesting. My 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 general sense of that has always been is that um, is that you know, the the classical foundation kind of dominated education until you get to the 1960s where that really starts to unravel. But I, I guess it was the it was a longer a, a longer kind of march. I think that's my understanding okay. of it. I mean, there are other people who know this better. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that's my understanding of it. Okay, interesting. So he gives a definition of education, okay, which is really helpful if we're going to spend a whole book on it, right? Yes. <laughs> and he, he says the time period that we're dealing with is 1000 BC to AD 500. Okay. Now, when someone asks you, Jeff, uh, you're a classicist, so what exactly, you know, do you study? Mm-hmm. How do you typically answer that question? I should say that uh, anything that uh, is encapsulated by the ancient Greco-Roman world okay. is fair game for a classicist. Okay. Right? And sometimes I'll put a, a, a chronological bracket on that, right. which is, is not far from the bracket that you no. just gave. Yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. I usually tell them I'm responsible for everything that happened in the Mediterranean between Homer, 780, mm-hmm. 800 BC, through St. Augustine, yes. 430. Right. It's very similar to this. Yeah. I then qualify it by saying, and I'm not an expert in hardly any of it, <laughs> right, right? Right, right, right. Numismatics, <laughs> coins, uh, you know, paleography. My expertise is very narrow. Exactly. But, but I mean, the, the beauty of that is when you when you talk about the things that you are have some expertise in, right. you can quickly connect the dots to a whole bunch of other yes, things. Yes, that's right? fascinating. Yep. So Mahru continues. Uh, we're still in the introduction, pages 12 and 13. This time period allows room for several complex stages of development. The subject is, however, more unified and more closely defined than we should expect, for the ancient Mediterranean world knew only one classical education, only one coherent and clearly defined educational system. Hmm. It is true that this did not appear at the beginning in its final fully developed form. It reached this only at a comparatively later date, which I place after the decisive contributions of the two great educators, Plato, who died in 348, and Isocrates, who died in 338. Okay. So I guess he was the younger contemporary. Mm. Mm-hmm. He says, this need not surprise us. Now here's the definition, and I'd like you to interact with this, Jeff, and see what you think. Okay. Education is a collective technique which a society employs to instruct its youth in the values and accomplishments of the civilization within which it exists. I, I like it. I mean, I'm, I I'm hope he, he kind of dials down more specifically because that's, that's a very broad statement. But I mean, I think he's saying that... Um, uh, edu- education 
um, has to be there has to be kind of a shared idea about what it means, right. a shared idea of, of what's important in education. So the, uh, a society kind of collectively deciding on what education should be. Mm -hmm. I think this was in large part the strong push for public schools in the United States hmm. was that there would be a unified, um, I went to public school yeah. um, as a child, um, that there would be a unified civil education Right. For yeah. everyone involved, like Eisenhower's uh, famous statement. Right. The um, the American people are a very religious. What did he say? The American people are a very religious nation and it doesn't matter which one or they all worship God and it doesn't matter which one. <laughs> Words to that effect. Right. There's also another uh, famous speech. Um, Eisenhower was like, was like wrapping up his term as, as right. president and somebody asked him, you know, to kind of sum things up. And he says, well, he says, the one thing I've learned in this job is two things. <laughs> What were they? I don't remember how it ended. I think <laughs> you probably lost a lot of people at that point. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's um, as he defines it, it's a collective technique, right? Mm -hmm. um, instilling values, instilling um, values and accomplishments of that civilization. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's, a, that's an idea, uh, my sense, in, in today's broader culture that's very much out of favor. Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, Tremendous splintering. Yes. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I think a lot of that, you know, the, the pushback against, um, you know, the classics and classicism, right. it's almost like, you know, who did these Greeks think they are? You know, right. Why are, why, why should we recognize them as being better than anything else? Of course they don't think right. at all. They have nothing to do with this, right? They've been dead for thousands of years. <laughs> right. Right. But I get, you know, the, the, I mean, those who, who would, I know what you're saying. Right. You know what I'm saying. Right? Yeah. Right. I just mean, it's a little bit ridiculous on its face. Mm hmm because i mean the the antagonism is misplaced yes but there don't you don't you kind of feel this idea out there that um there's kind of like well you know all cultures are equal and uh to, oh yeah to, to, to say you know how would you even you know how, how would you even go about saying well uh why are is greek culture you know better or yeah. more important than fill in the blank right um uh, it just I, I find it. So, I, what do you think? I about find it frustrating. That? Well, I when when people have when this is this kind of stuff has kind of come up in in, in class, um, I say, well, okay, I think I think you can measure cultures. Yes, right? you, you you can uh, cultures. You can good and bad in different ways. Exactly right, and just in terms of of of, of influence, right. both good and bad, you can say that that uh, some cultures have left a much bigger um, footprint. Yes, than, than others, and this to me, this well, is well, not controversial. No, it's largely because of the survival of their literature. Yeah, which is often just an accident of history, right? And it was no particular individual's intention, right? Right, right. Yeah, um, we're, I think we're getting kind of oh well. I'd like to blame you. Okay, uh, please do so. <laughs> Take, get us back on the path. Yeah. You? So Malhru has this one really um, good quote here that I think helps shape the entire book. He says, the record of the period we are about to investigate, again, 1000 BC to 500 AD, does not conform to the famous parabola shape, ascent, highest point of Acme, and inevitable decline that was so dear to antiquity. Hmm. So he quotes here a Polybius book six. So uh, the ancients were fascinated with, obsessed with this idea of a parabola. I mean, not the ge geometrical shape, but what it indicates, right? Mm -hmm. You begin, you wax strong, you reach the peak, and then you go on the decline back to the original starting point. Yes. So I used to tell people that uh, Aristotle um, famously said, a man reaches his intellectual peak at the age of 49. Hmm. Now that I'm on the other side. <laughs> it's all downhill from here. <laughs> I don't say that quite so much. Right, right. Which right. means I'll have the same intellectual capacity at what? Um, I don't know, 69 as I had at 29. Yeah. Right. Uh, you, I mean, at 29, you were, you were, you were most pistons firing. I okay. I nothing to worry about. <laughs> he says, that's not how it works. No doubt at the beginning of our inquiry, we can trace an ascending curve. That of the development which took place from the 10th to the 4th century BC okay. and brought classical education from birth to maturity, part one of this book. But this state of intrinsic perfection was not confined to a brief acme. Classical education took a long time to mature and receive its definitive character, but once this was reached, it lasted for many centuries throughout the Hellenistic era and beyond, and the infusion of new blood from Rome gave it a fresh lease of life. There was no decline in the curve. It split into two and then continued in parallel lines, two parallel lines. 
going on indefinitely in the Byzantine East, the other existing in the Latin countries until it was brutally brought to an end by historical events. Yeah. The invasions and the disappearance of the political framework of the empire. Right. So that's very interesting, right? Yeah. You can you can note a kind of ascent at the beginning, but then it remains strong until it just kind of dropped out of use. Yeah. Now, I, I can see uh, that. I mean, that's related to his argument that um, education is kind of the crown jewel of, of what Greco-Roman um, society left to us yep. because it, it doesn't it doesn't kind of collapse as other parts of, of um, like Athens and Rome rise and fall. And that's right. It kind of has its own trajectory. That's really interesting. It is. Yeah. And speaking of crown jewels. Yes. It's time for the ads. Right. This episode of Ad Nauseum is brought to you by Racial Coffee. Now, Jeff, mm-hmm. when we have traveled, yes. what do we usually talk about upon our return? We talk about, um, well, we talk about, I talk about one, how much I miss my bed. Yes. And uh, second, how much I miss my coffee machine. Yeah. So yeah. I understand you were down, when you were down in Dallas. Yes. You, you slept on the pullout. I did. It was probably the, How would you describe well, that? It was the one kind of black mark on an otherwise wonderful weekend. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yes. Yeah, so the, my, my two buddies took the beds in the Airbnb. Right. I, got the, I took the pillow. I, I mean, I, I thought I was being the bigger man. But you were. Yes. I took and the you came out of it the broken man. I did. I mean, this, the mattress, if you want to call it that, yeah. was a, was a collection of coiled springs yes. covered by some sort of like plastic wrap oh no <laughs> <laughs> every time you every time i kind of made a slight move you could hear the you know the boring yeah yeah uh, it, was, it was horrible those are the times when you pray for the dawn yeah, ex- when will this night be over exactly right <laughs> and and the place we stayed had a coffee machine All right a coffee but, machine was it a but, ratio it was not a ratio it was a keurig but oh, were, you're not supposed to say that the, the, it was the, a Gurick. it was a Gurick. And but there were no Guric pods anywhere in the area, so it was unusable. But you know that didn't bother me because I knew if I had tried it, it wouldn't be the same. No, as home. Right, no, yeah. you can't count on Guric or Dak and Blecker. Right? Yeah. Did you have some decent coffee in your trip? I'm guessing. Um, it, uh, I'm, no. Yeah, I'm guessing it disappointed. No, right. the, the uh, what Marcru has been using the term Achme. Yes. I think the Nadir, <laughs> right, which is the absolute low point. Yes. The Nadir was on the flight back. Oh no! It was a little bit late. And, you know, what would you like to drink, sir? Um, I'll take some decaf. Just thinking, you know, he gave me a cup with hot water and a tiny little packet. <laughs> yeah. I had to pour the crystals in myself oh. and then stir it. Oh, and they man. never completely dissolve. Oh, so That's awful. It's like drinking grape nuts. Right. So when you got home, oh, <laughs> back to your... In addition to a wonderful reunion with my family. Yes. You had uh, the ratio eight yes. the next morning. That's right, with yeah. my barraza grinder, and uh, just did it perfectly and a delicious coffee. Fantastic. So, hey, listeners, check out this company. Uh, go to ratiocoffee.com. They've got the ratio eight, which is kind of the uh, the top of the line. The flagship. The flagship. The Queen Mary. We got the ratio six, which is kind of the, the, the little brother. Yep. Uh, still a wonderful uh, uh, big machine, a little bit more accessible you, financially. You, you traveled with the ratio six for a while. I did. It was great. It I, was your entry point. It, it was. I still have it on my shelf. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm loathe to depart with it i know and then coming soon is the ratio four the ratio four which i i'm 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 hoping i'm guessing our audience is is uh, is, is excited about they're gonna yep. snap this up yep. because it has the same great technology the fibonacci head no scorch pad underneath so you're not gonna uh-huh. have any brackish tang exactly right uh but it's also going to be a little more personalized in size and a more attainable price point i was thinking as i was staying in this pretty nice hotel in waco mm-hmm that uh, in a year's time, a couple of years' time, in my room will be a ratio four, not the plastic hunk of junk that they were giving me. Yes, exactly. That, so you are convinced it's going to take the country. Oh, yeah, stuff. I am yeah. convinced Fantastic. for sure. Right. So listeners, do yourself a favor. Uh, go to RatioCoffee.com. Uh, find one of these wonderful machines. Uh, uh, click on the one you want and type in this coupon code, A-N-C-O-F-7. Yes. And that will get them 15% off your entire order. What what does the F stand for? Um, Flights of Fancy. Wow, t- uh, two Fs. Two Fs. All right, yeah. Flights of Fancy. You got Flights it. Flights of Fancy with your coffee. Check it out. This episode of Odd Nauseam is also brought to you by the great folks at Hackett Publishing. Uh, this These guys carrying the torch of, of the classics as well as all kinds of other corners of academia. They've been with us from the very beginning of this, this humble little podcast. They believed in us. And um, I love this company. Uh, the more I, I, I use their books, uh, the more I think about how they've been such a great supporter uh, mm-hmm. of us and of the classics. Uh, I'm really excited that we get to uh, kind of plug them in this particular way. That's right. Just today, I was telling a friend about Augustine's little dialogue that he wrote after his conversion when he went off to Kasiki Akam 
it was uh, against the academics, contra academicos, mm -hmm. and uh, on the teacher, de magistro. Yeah. I'd really like to do an episode on that volume at some point, uh, on the teacher, because it's, it's quite germane. Guess who publishes an excellent and inaffordable and affordable and expensive translation of those two dialogues? I'm going to guess Hackett Publishing. Good guess. Yes. That's right. <laughs> it's the same uh, size and style and layout as their Meditations of Philosophy by, you know, Descartes. Extremely accessible, affordable, excellent quality translations. Yes. And I encourage the listeners, I th I'm thinking about uh, now our two most recent shout outs. Uh, yep. Ms. Ms. Ladd. Right. And I think it was what, Michael Stell. That's correct. Last week. Wow. How do you remember? Well, I, I remember them because both of them talked about how they have taken advantage of the yes. Hackett coupon code and they've bought several books. Correct. Uh, we talked, um, uh, Hope, our, our shout out, she's uh, gotten the Bryn Mawr uh, commentaries. That's right. And so uh, take a cue from them. Yes. We'd really appreciate that. It does support the podcast. It, it keeps us going. And uh, you're going to land yourself some great deals. So what you need to do, listener, please, is go to hackitpublishing.com. That's T-T-E-K-C-A-H. Is that right? No, I think you did that backwards. Oh, sorry. It's H-A-C-K-E-T-T publishing.com. Yep. Shop around, drop some stuff in your little grocery satchel, mm -hmm. and then they need to enter a coupon code. Am yes. I right? Yes, that would be AN2023. What does that get them, Jeff? That gets them two wonderful things, 20% off their entire order and free shipping. Check it out. All right, Dave. So as we get back into this, uh, where do we, can we get get into the meat of this? Are, we, we, are we still talking about like definitions of no, education, we, or, or where, where are we going? We got to spend a little more time in the introduction. Okay, let's do we, it. We got to lay the groundwork. I'm getting impatient, but I'll, I know I'll Jeff. It. Yep, too much do. coffee. Yep. So uh, an important part of the introduction is, and this book is so well laid out. Each section has a nice title, which gives you a summary of its content. Nice. From the noble warrior to the scribe. Ooh, okay. All yeah. right. So, to sum up this complex development in a simple formula, it might be said that the history of ancient education reflects the progressive transition from a noble warrior culture to a scribe culture. Okay. There are refined, mature civilizations on which the legacy of the past, embodied in a written form, presses heavily, and whose education is, in consequence, dominated by the technique of writing. These are the people of the book. Al-El-Kitab, as the Quran calls the Jews and Christians, with a, res with a respect not unmixed with astonishment. So in this portion, he develops this idea that eventually um, large empires arose and the, the notion of the isolated noble warrior, like an Achilles, mm -hmm. right, or a Hector or Diomedes, began to give way to another ideal of culture, which was the individual who started out as a kind of a low bookkeeper keeping records and accounts, the kinds of things that are on the, the linear B tablets, yeah. right? So-and-so bought five liters of olive oil and sold three bushels of wheat, on and on. Yes. But that eventually developed into a culture of writing. Yeah. And that is the scribe. From, so the, it's, from the, it's kind of ultimately a, a revenge of the nerds, <laughs> right? The, 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 the As you read it, that's kind of how it is. <laughs> yeah, I, lo I love it. It's kind of how it is. Yeah. Yeah. But, right. you know, there were um, multiple, um, he uses the term Oriental, these would be called, these would be called now A-N-E, right? Ancient Near Eastern cultures. Right, right. In the right. 1950s, they were called Oriental, but Ancient Near Eastern. Egyptians, Mesopotamians, Syrians, he finds echoes of this in the book of Proverbs, right? As a handbook of moral education, hmm. quote, for the training of the perfect civil service clerk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the Hebrew word for uh, scribe, right? He says, it is a remarkable fact that the sign for seish, which is Egyptian for scribe, depicts all the tools used in writing, a calamus, a reed, a water pot, and a palette with two saucers, one for black ink, the other for red. In Hebrew, scribe is rendered sefer, a word which, like sefer, a book, is derived from safar, which means to write or to count. Hmm. So... In other words, the ancient Near Eastern, or what Mahru calls Oriental cultures, had been doing this for a long time. Yes. This then, with the arrival of you know letters and Homer, 8th century, started to transition Greece and eventually Rome from the noble warrior culture to the scribe culture. Okay. Now, does Mahru make any argument that... Um that we can um, kind of connect the the dots between these cultures that that um, the the Greeks are directly borrowing no. or nothing like that. No, that's okay. in another book, right? 
What? That's in um, ML West's uh, The East Face of oh. Helicon. Yes, 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 yes. It's also a little bit in, um, right, Giving Goliath His Due. Right. Uh, that's what was kind of reminding me of. Right? And in many yeah. other books. He doesn't really dwell on that. Yeah. He says, this is page 15, we're almost out of the introduction. From the social and political point of view, the scribes appear above the popular classes of peasants and manual workers as an upper class raised over the unorganized mass of serfs and more or less directly sharing in the exercise of power. No doubt many of them had only a fraction of this power, but the constitution of these centralized absolute monarchies was such that everyone had a fair chance. There were opportunities for the recognition of merit, and there was room for the exercise of patronage. Any scribe could hope that he might one day rise to the highest office in the state. That sounds very optimistic. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, it sounds. I mean, it sounds a little. Doesn't it sound a little bit kind of uh, uh, romantic? Uh, uh, no, I think it's more. Um, it's just a description of what happened of the the replacement of the noble warrior. Okay. With a more, um, I don't know, communitarian view mm. of civilization and development. Okay. When we get on to Spartan education, he makes the really interesting claim that I had never seriously considered. And that's the you know measure of my own education. Sparta was unique. Because it didn't go this way. It was not unique because it developed something new. It was unique because it refused to change. Ah, yeah. From the archaic system. Right, 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 right. Which on reflection is so obvious, but yes. I didn't think of it at the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Finally, this was a characteristic feature of the system, he says. We shall see it appearing again at the end of the development of classical culture in the bureaucracy of the late Roman Empire. So think about that for a minute, right? At the end of antiquity, what yeah. is what is the hallmark? It's every city, every part of their large Roman Empire being ruled by a bureaucratic class. Yeah, 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 yeah. And in between, you know, the flowering, you might say, of classical culture. All right. All right, Dave, please tell us. Okay, we're out of the introduction, right? Almost. We're almost out of there? Okay. Almost. Can you get us out of it? Okay, All so right. here's the, the final summary quote, which I think nicely sets the tone. Okay. Education is not an element that can be detached from one civilization and borrowed by another. So we'll stop right there. What do you think? Um, I mean, I what's he saying? That he's not saying that uh, the the, the educational systems and values of one culture can't influence another. No, he says you you can't detach it from the civilization in which it arose and just begin using it in another. Oh, okay. Another place. Yeah. Because there are so many interrelated assumptions and expectations. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I buy that. Okay. Okay. He says, it is the concentrated epitome of a culture, and as such, it is inseparable from the form of that culture and perishes with it. And in actual fact, Greek culture, under the stress of the Dorian invasion, reverted violently to a stage of barbaric warfare, after which Greek education bore no relation to that of Minoan times and was for many centuries to be utterly different from that of the Oriental scribes. Okay. Its history, like that of classical culture as a whole, can only start with Homer. Gotcha, right. So I mean, so he's re he's referring to um, that, that so-called kind of Greek Dark Age, right? Kind of mm -hmm. Roughly 1200 to 800, where uh, there is a, a kind of a going backwards. That's a, right. A, a, a going dark, mm -hmm. where there is no development or, or, or any semblance of, of um, a culture progressing along any line. Yes. Right? And to make a fairly programmatic statement, this is one of my own, I think this um, casts a lot of doubt uh, on the notion that one culture can imitate the pra educational practices of another culture successfully mm -hmm. and therefore call it the same thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. So pursuing classical education, classical culture, right? Um, maybe no one makes the actual claim, we're doing what the ancients did. Yeah. Maybe they're wiser than that. But I think if anyone were to to make that claim and really believe, we are we are educating ourselves and our children in the way that the ancients educated themselves and their children. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's a, a claim that can really bear a whole lot of scrutiny. Right. right. Because of the vast difference um, in the two the two worlds and the civilizations that represent them. Right. So when it comes down to talking about, um, so if we're doing classical education, what is it about classical education that we value enough to make the center of how we educate uh, ourselves and our children today? Yeah. We, um, we have to kind of strip it down to, to particular values. Depending. It's going to be a highly selective set of values. Yes. And I think for the most part, the ancients would not find it all that similar mm. as we start to go through. 
uh, some of these different examples, oh. starting with Homer, then the Spartans, then old Athenian education, Isocrates, Plato, and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we have time just to crack, you know, the crack the surface. Is surface something you crack? What's the what's the metaphor I'm looking for here? Is it, scratch. Is, scratch the surface, right? Can we crack something? We can, we can maybe break the surface? We no, we no. That's scratch too, the surface. Scratch it, okay. We crack some eggs. Okay. And uh, get into the first chapter. Let's do it. Okay. It is important to remember, uh, page three, which is not page three, <laughs> <laughs> that Homer is a poet, not a historian. Moreover, that he gives free rein to his creative imagination, since he sets out not to describe scenes from real life, but to paint a picture of heroic deeds projected into a fascinating far off past when not only gods, but beasts could speak. Think of Xanthos, for example, one of Achilles' horses, prophesying to his master. Like Rollins' horse in the Petit Roi de Galice of Victor Hugo, I think it means the, the little king of France, mm -hmm. it is important not to exaggerate the naive and primitive character of this work, which had so much mature experience behind it. But Jeff, I think we should probably start to wind down here a little bit. Yes. So I'll just give a brief overview of what's coming next. In this chapter, he's going to talk about Chiron, the, the nice centaur. Yes. And Phoenix, the tutor of Achilles. Right. And the themes we've talked about before, which is that the Homeric knight with his chivalry has to be a speaker of words and a doer of deeds. Yes. Yes, so, yes, yes, yeah. You remember that the famous scene in Iliad Book 6 where Glaucon and Diomedes meet on the field? Of course. And they uh, they talk about what it means, you know, to be the ideal hero. Right. And there's this famous line, just to get a little bit of Greek in here, Ayan Arista Wayne Kaihu Perokonem Menayalon, which means, as Maru translates it, always be the best and keep well ahead of the others. Okay, yeah. So is that how you spent your time with your buddies in Dallas? Always be the best. Always, well, keep ahead of the others. You know, I do. Uh, you know, it's uh, 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 your, to answer the question. No. Yes. Because um, you chose to sleep on the pullout. Right, right. That was not Homeric. No, it was not. It was that was not noble warrior. That was more like a scribe. Exactly right. It was it was self sacrifice. Right. right. But um, it, those words remind me of. Um, I'm sure you had these friendships uh, when uh, I had them, particularly when I was younger, when your conversation are mostly. Everybody trying to one up each other. Oh yes, right? it's exhausting. It is exhausting. Right. But I don't think that's the the spirit of what is meant by you know stay ahead of always be the best and stay ahead of others. Um, well, no, because that's an entirely intellectual exercise. You know, if you were trying to one up each other with pistols and drawn swords, yeah, that's more Homeric. Yes, exactly. That happened much more. Rare, Did it happen rare, rarely? <laughs> rarely yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, next time we're going to look at. Um, the distinction he draws between the technical and the ethical aspects of the Homeric world. Okay. And then we're going to get into Spartan education. I'm excited about that. It's really fascinating. Yeah. Excellent. But as we often say, we're up against it. We are up against it. And we got to get out of here. Um, but before we do, uh, Dave, please, a little bit about the Moss Method and LPSI, if you uh, would. I'd love to. Right. Yep. So if you want to study some Greek uh, with me, you want to go to mossmethod.com, check out my program that takes you from? Uh, neophyte to erudite. That's correct. And uh, I realized this week that the Greek instruction I offer has a little bit of a patriotic element. Do you oh. want to know why? Why? Because it goes from psi to shining psi. Oh. Uh, please carry on. Wasn't that so bad? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's not bad. All right. Not bad. Not bad. Anyway, uh, I've spent more than 30 years studying Greek. I think I am an advanced student of Greek, and I'd like to share that experience with you for a, you know, a modest fee. So at mossmethod.com, you can check out a lot of my free instruction on a number of classical authors, as well as the New Testament. If you like what you see, sign up for the course. It's very comprehensive. Um, there's no reason not to. Excellent. We also yes. have the Black Friday Cyber Monday coming up. Wait, the Black Friday Monday is coming up? That's correct. You know how I look In about a month. <laughs> yep. So uh, we'll have a sale then, but uh, there's no reason not to sign up now. Excellent. And how about if, if uh, people out there want to study some Latin? Right. If you want to go ab initio, from the ground up, from the, from the beginning... I have a program uh, based on Hans Orberg's Lingua Latina Per Se Illustrata, Latin Teaches Itself, uh, the Familia Romana book. Go to latinperdm.com slash LLPSI. So here I'm teaching the book, teaching you how to read Latin, how to speak Latin, how to write Latin. 
uh, teaching four students in the studio. You can follow along, watch their triumphs, uh, Josh and Kenneth and Lauren and Katie, watch their defeats and, you know, learn along with them without all the pressure. Excellent. Hey, we got uh, people to thank. Absolutely. Mishka, as always, um, who uh, takes care of the sound, the engineering, the editing, makes it sound great week she's after week. A, she's a wonder, I have to tell you. She's she a does wonder. amazing work. Yep. And how about these musicians? Oh, incredible. Scott Vincent, Ken Tamplin. That guy can play the guitar. Yes. Uh, and blues, just uh, great blues. He's got a guitar school, scottvinzenmusic.com, if you want to learn how to play like that. It might take 20 years. Yeah. But you got to start out somewhere, and it's good to start from a master. So, and Ken has his vocal academy. Yeah, right? he does. Yep. So Ken Tamplin, if you want to learn how to 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 to, to, to screech like to belt in to, five uh, five octaves. octaves, right, right. <laughs> Check out uh, Ken Tamplin's vocal academy. Check out some of. His, I love watching his clips. Do you? Where where he does like uh, reaction videos to various right, singers. Right. It's it's fantastic. Yeah, he can sing and play That's the guitar, it. and very generous. We're thankful that they they let us use uh, their music without charge. Very right. generous. And how about if somebody wants to get in touch with us, Dave. Okay. Well, what they should do is they should uh, email Jeff at ad nauseum.com. Now, there's a V in ad nauseum. Send yes. Jeff lots of compliments and encouragement. Uh, you know, thank him for taking one for the team on so many occasions. Yes. Um, ideas for new shows, things like that. Yeah. And if you want to write to Dave, you can, I can send him uh, a lot of encouragement as well. He's, he's so needy, this guy <laughs> across the table from me. But write to Dave at ad nauseum, at Dave at ad nauseum.com. Again, don't forget that V. You can go to our website, check out the Lurch with Merch section, get yourself a nice t-shirt that is ad nauseum themed or maybe a hat. Yes. And uh, quite no Kent, do Kent on those t-shirts. I have to say, my, when my buddy picked me up at the airport in, right. in, in uh, DFW, he was wearing his quite no Kent, do Kent t-shirt. Awesome. That was great. That's I, great. I, I was so flattered by that. Was it the was it the one where Hercules is wrestling the lion or it's, uh, Atlas holding Atlas. a... It's, it's the Atlas one, but the black and orange, it looks yeah, sharp. It looks, it's a sharp shirt. Yeah, it sticks out. It was great. Mm-hmm. So Dave, next week, as we've said, we're going to continue our look at, at, at Murrow's book. That's correct. And get into some, um, some Homer and, and Spartan education. And Spartan, yep. yep. A History of Education in Antiquity, Part 2. Now, as I said, you know, it's a thick book. We might break things up a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. We might have some holiday-themed episodes as we've had in the past. That's what it's looking like, don't you think? Yes, definitely. Okay. Yep. So I think you, Dr. Winkle, have the gustatory parting shot. I do, and I'm excited about this one. Because I found a, a, a gustatory quote. It yeah. references food. Right. But it also has a classical reference in it as well. That's so, perfect. So it's, the, it's the, uh, the, the, the duofecta. The double whammy. The double whammy. And this is a quote from the great British writer Samuel Johnson, who says, A man is in general better pleased when he has a good dinner upon his table than when his wife talks Greek. Is that a little chauvinist? I, you know, I, no, I don't think so. I think no? what, he, what he's saying is that his wife talking Greek is awesome. Right. And he loves it. He says, but uh, even... That pales in comparison to a great dinner. I guess I was assuming that the the woman cooked the meal, but it doesn't say that anywhere, does it? I think that's probably probably the assumption. But I don't think we am I overanalyzing. I, it? I think so. And I, don't, <laughs> I don't think we 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 don't have to read a kind of uh, you know, sexist chauvinism into this. No. I think he's he's excited. Says I look. I have a wife who not only speaks Greek, but can she can cook? She can cook. All right. Thanks for listening. Thank you. <laughs>